However, when we went to uh -huh. <laughs> we went to California. There was a whole contingent of people. Oh, yeah. 40 people. And they had like 40 flats. Oh my god! Oh my god. I guess we'll just call this our pre-adventure adventure. Well, nope. Before you go, oh, sorry. Well, there wasn't that motor on that. He almost hit you with his bike and yelled at you. No, oh, it would have hurt him more than it hurt me. It is about move that bus time. Tell me when I can push it. All right, I'm waiting for the signal. I'm sorry? We do. We do. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. All right, we're going to need the button. Give that button a push. Do it again. Yeah, and I'd hold it. Just stay cold right there. All right, for pause for photo opportunities. Now, Sean's capturing his. I'm going to get out of that photo. Looks like she's starting the bus. Thank you. Is it done now? Yes. That's what you get for the. You've been a wonderful You have to stay there all And now, ladies and gentlemen, the gentlemen you've never met before, but secretly, deep down inside, you've all been waiting for Steven. Oh my goodness, what an intro. Wow, I'm going to come and give you guys a wave. Hang on. Classic Gothic architecture. They are uh, sort of cutting edge technology from the 13th, 14th century. So that was when stonemasons who build this place, and by the way, when this church is being built outside here, very little. So totally dominating the horizon. You've got wooden structures, one, two stories. So, you know, it's hugely impressive. It takes hundreds of years to build this church, started a thousand years ago. But those stone supports, guys, the, 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 the arching that lead to the roof, um, are what enable that church inside uh, to be the tallest nave of a church in this country. When we're inside in a moment, you'll see what uh, these guys were able to do inside. So it was hugely important in terms of building history, really. Um, when you get to Paris, Notre Dame uh, is also a Gothic church, but of a different style. This is English Gothic. Notre Dame is a much larger church, more similar in size to St. Paul's, which we'll see tomorrow. This is, a, this is a more slender church, and this is actually the Queen's church. It's really the Queen's local church. She's married here. She's crowned here. Uh, you know, uh, her grandson's wedding took place here. Her daughter-in-law, Diana's funeral took place here. It's a church she knows very, very well. Not a cathedral. It's not a cathedral. Right, folks. Um, what you've got here is the east end of the church. Uh, we'll be inside there later on, known as the Lady Chapel, or the King Henry the Seventh Chapel. He's buried inside there. You'll see his tomb later. 
Um, this dates from the 1500s, so it's it's actually newer than what we were just looking at, which was 1300, so 200 years yeah. later. Um, this church is built over hundreds of years, hundreds of years to build it. Tomorrow, we'll see the outside of St. Paul's Cathedral, built 35 years, beginning to end. This church, hundreds of years. Um, but this is a classic example of purely English Gothic architecture. Inside, the ceiling is, is world famous, and I'll talk, talk to you about that when we head inside. Now look across the street, look how similar the architecture is at Parliament. So you've got this quite uh, interesting combination here. Rivel, known as Big Bang. Um, you can see beyond it the London Eye. So you've got two iconic landmarks of London, one from the um, 19th century, one from the 21st century. So if you're still scratching your head going, where am I? Um, the tone of the bell, very, very distinctive. Um, and maybe we'll hear it as we head round um, uh, the corner. But um, it's the bell inside that's, that's known as Big Bang, not the tower, not the clock. And so these are the Parliament buildings in front of you. There is one remaining older section of the building. It's right here with this roof, Westminster Hall. Dates from the 1400s. And that is where monarchs are laid in state after their death to pay their respects at Westminster Hall. The roof um, was where chapters of the Bible were read by monks to those illiterate people uh, who, who couldn't read themselves. Then they would go in the church and they would see the same glass and they would see the images of the, of the stories that they heard. So it was they understood. Um, but no monks here. I don't see any monks. 500 years ago, King Henry of Rockland never told really in our stories in London. It's a terribly balloon, and I'm not going to fail with that. But through Mary, he meets her younger sister, Anne, and he wants to divorce Catherine of Aragon. Was an extremely high status Spanish princess, very closely linked to the church in Rome, and they absolutely forbid a divorce from this woman. Um, and Henry decides when this divorce is forbidden that he's going to decide to give himself a divorce by creating a new church, the Church of England. He makes himself head, gives himself a divorce, no problem. But what does that mean? It means the monks who represent the Roman Catholic Church, he needs them out of here. And they are unceremoniously booted out of this church, the Collegiate Church of St. Matthew. Um, when the monks were here, this would have looked quite different. Gloves in these niches. There would have been um, braziers, which are um, stoves to warm the place, and mats. Um, but if you look in the ground, look on the walls, you can see that there's something else now that uh, takes the place of the monks. Commemorative memorials or memorials and burials. And after the monks have gone, um, this church becomes famous for its burials. Um, you know, uh, the, um, the reasoning behind it. We pray for ourselves, for all that lies ahead of us as well, for all that is behind us. Father, we offer you this day all our thoughts and words and actions. All our sufferings and disappointments, all our hopes and joys, and we unite our lives in the of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Just for a moment.
Well, it is the IRS. I put that up at the top. So you can see the other version instrument. I think they were generating them. Stop reading. Yeah. 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 Find you can't find them on the street. Right, figure here, make the big speech. All right. The other element is the ring here. Make the eyes blinking. Oh, okay. Whoa. <laughs> and then finally, you have this palette with those two strings. You put your two fingers like this, and you just pull it, and you have the wings. Oh. Okay. Wings. So. When the actors start to learn the puppetry with me, usually it's, it's this. <laughs> you see? So, yes, how are you doing? Are you okay? So, that's, that's very, you know, it's not very obvious to be fair because, you know, you have to have a very straight position and have the, like, the, the you know, the body flat and the neck a bit bent like this, never straight like that, okay? This is the neutral position. And then the second thing is the focus, the way you look, okay? So, if I look at you, I have to look at you there and not look at you, right? And I look at you, okay? So too much your focus. Second thing is the speech. So if I speak to you like this, it doesn't work. But now, if I speak to you like this, <laughs> you see? That's the other puppet. So it's a very, it's a very you know, um, difficult you know, way of you know, using it, but at the end it works. Did you find it well in the show? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Um, When you go inside, there's a painted uh, a ceiling, which isn't the exterior dome, because in between there's a brick dome, in effect. So there are three ceilings, because if you were inside and were looking up at, at that um, mass of, of, of lead, it would look like a huge black hole, basically. Ah. So they made a, a lower dome inside. Yeah, they, get they don't like to be alone, those uh, <laughs> but um, welcome onto the Millennium Footbridge. Millenn Millennium Footbridge, as the name implies, was built for the year 2000 and one of the first pedestrian bridges to cross the River Thames in a long, long time. And the day it opened, thousands of people came. There was a charity run. The Queen had opened it in the morning and then the public were invited. But the day it opened was the day it closed. Because so many people got on this bridge, the thing started to wobble. And what happened was they had not quite got their mathematical sums right with the, with the damp and the, the, the spring of the bridge. So it's closed, six months later reopened, and it's fine. It doesn't wobble any longer. Designed by Norman Foster, a very famous British architect, who claimed it's not my bridge that wobbles, it's the way people walk on my bridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good way. You can only walk on this bridge <laughs> Yeah, you've got to, you know, it's like, you know, I guess the bridal march or something. Um, the building over the distance is the I'm telling you all of the English versions of American versions, right? So lift, elevator, gherkin, pickle, geek, anorak. <laughs> um, Norman Foster uh, designed the, um, the gherkin, which is home to a Swiss reinsurance company. Um, but this bridge links the north to the south side of the River Thames. Traditionally wealth and poverty, rich, poor. Now, not, not so much. Everything is expensive in the centre of London. <laughs> but this is a modern link, um, and you can see St Paul's there in this bridge, and it links over to this building on the left, the Museum of Modern Art for London Tate and Modern. This used to be the Bankside Power Station, became obsolete very, very quickly, built in the 40s. And it was going to be knocked down, but for the millennium, it was also reconfigured as London's Museum of Modern Art. A, f a free museum, by the way, folks. So even if you don't like modern art, check out the inside of that building. It is the most amazing space. The turbine hall, where the engine stood, has been gutted, and it's this incredibly beautiful space. Um, the architectural practice Herzog de Moura, very famous architectural practice from Switzerland, and you can see their work around the world. I think the most recent project that they were involved with in the US was the um, de Young Museum in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. They designed that. Um, so North Bank linking now to South Bank. And if you look across carefully, see the small building with the 
half timbering white structure and a thatched roof just to the left of the bridge. Do you see that with the flag? That's Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Shakespeare's Globe Theatre now rebuilt on the site where it stood originally, thanks really to an American citizen. Came to London after the war, looked for all connections to Shakespeare, was horrified to find that only the remnants of the old globe in the ground made it his life's work to have this building recreated as an open galleried, half timbered Elizabethan theatre. And the show goes on in the open, it's open air, rain or shine. Oh no umbrellas allowed. Um, the season is still going on at the moment, so a really popular addition to the south side of the river. So, along with Tate Modern, uh, uh, the, um, the Globe Theatre, the London Eye, all of these buildings and uh, venues and attractions have really changed this side of the river. 30, 40 years ago, you would, wouldn't have been interested to come here. There was nothing to bring you here. So total regeneration. And there in the distance, guys, we'll see it closer up in a minute, Tower Bridge. Not London Bridge, Tower oh. Bridge. Where is London Bridge? London Bridge is in front of it. There's a ah. bus going over London Bridge at the oh, moment. Okay. It's a rather dull, Ordinary. concrete, Right, I've seen pictures of it. I just didn't bridge. know. And what did they sell to the folks in the was it yours? They sold old the, London The old bridge. one, and they rebuilt it. And very mean people claim, uh, say that he thought he was getting to No, no, no. I've seen programs on TV, and that's what he knew he was yeah. getting. So it's, it's a it's, slightly facetious yes, it is. comment there. Um, have it's, a look at the building the of going up. Lake Havasu, I think. Europe's tallest uh, structure. The shard, as in a shard of glass or an icicle. Um, it's topping out at about 75 stories, but it's going to reach, I think, about 85 stories with all the sort of technical stuff, uh, services at the top. It's uh, offices. It's a shard. Most of our time in the city of Westminster. Uh, today we will be going into the city of London, and there is indeed an icon of the city that will mark when we enter the city of London. Now I'm not going to reveal what that icon is here in the city, um, because I'm sure Stephen will reveal that surprise. But today we begin our adventure, a day for knights, a day for protectors of royalty, a day for kings, not necessarily a day for queens, Aww. or maybe even princes. There were a couple of tales that maybe today was not their day. I know, I know, it's a sad, sad time. But we will be making our way to St. Paul's right now. We're going to get a view of St. Paul's Cathedral and a little bit of the Millennia or the Wibbly Wobbly Bridge. And then back on the coach to the Tower of London, where many uh, a tale awaits us. And then after we have heard these stories, we have experienced some, of, some more of the history. We will be uh, providing the optional coach ride chariot over to the palace for a recession of the changing of the guards. So as they are marching away, the soldiers tired from 24 hours of on duty, we will get to see them with big smiles on their face. Well, not so much smiles, but a little more pep in their step as they are headed to the barracks. So without further ado, I turn you over to... Sure. Also, this afternoon, special feature just for this trip, the Adventures by Disney, Diz Meeting, 
for the UK visitors will be in the lounge at starting at 2 p.m. So if you are anxious for that one, time will fly as we are having fun in the city and two o'clock will be upon us before you even know it. Now there's a gentleman sitting just here to my left that you were happy to meet yesterday and anxious to hear from again. So I will turn it over to the one, the only, Stephen. Stephen! Woo! I'm, I'm giving you that royal wave. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like this that deserves a royal response, my gentlemen. Uh, well, welcome to day two here, folks. And straight away, let's look. There's a very special church we're passing on the right-hand side. Look at this church, the Church of St. Clement Danes. But look on the side of this church because you will see shrapnel damage left over from the bombing oh, wow. of the London wow. in 1940-41. We're going to hear a lot about history today and recent history today. On the left, the Royal Courts of Justice. Fantastical building uh, built in the late 1800s. But here comes the dragon, guys, on the right, in the middle of the road, the dragon marking the boundary of London. Now, um, the dragon marks the boundary of London. We'll see the dragon later today as well uh, when we head back out. But the dragon always marks the boundary of the city of London. Reflecting the independence uh, of the merchants in the old days, nowadays the financial community. So very much an independent uh, entity quite a mysterious entity. Uh, nowadays, though, we really talk about um, the city as being the financial district. So if you say to somebody in London, take me to the city, what they will do is take you to the financial district. It's like a New Yorker here in Wall Street. So somebody in London will say, ah, they want to go to the city. On the left, another object, uh, a site I want you to look at here, the old Cheshire Cheese, one of the oldest inns London. And coming up also on the right hand side in a minute, a very special little church. So look carefully here to the right, up this next alleyway at the spire of St. Bride's Church, one of the most beautiful spires in London, the work of Christopher Wren. Look up at that church. Those of you on the left, check it out. It's reflected in the glass uh, of the buildings next door. St. Bride's, the work of Christopher Wren. Christopher Wren. Christopher Wren's masterpiece, or actually I say masterwork, because I think all his churches are masterpieces, is St. Paul's. St. Paul's is London's cathedral. And those of you with uh, with me yesterday, uh, you probably remember hearing me say that St. Paul's is a cathedral. The Abbey is not a cathedral. So here in London, we have uh, St. Paul's uh, as our uh, official seat where Richard Chances, the Bishop of London, has his throne, or Cathedra, Cathedra. And that's where we get the name Cathedral. Um, so what we're gonna do in uh, a moment is Stephen, our driver, is gonna set us down, and uh, we're gonna have a walk uh, around this area, and then head back onto the coach for the tower. Perfect. So Stephen's going to do um, uh, do a surreal treat, guys. What we're going to do, we're going to get off the coach here, uh, where he can stop, and uh, we're going to have a look at this church. And those of you who stay on the coach will meet you back at the coach in 15, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll continue on to the tower. So for those of you who wish to come and hear about St Paul's Cathedral. And this is the church, by the way, where... 15 foot thick walls at the bottom, 11 foot thick at the top. And do you see the top three sets of windows and chairs, smaller ones, are original Norman, what we call Norman windows. They are about a thousand years old. The larger windows come later. And it's called the White Tower. Lots of royal stuff. Um, built with light colored stone that they whitewashed constantly and built on a source of water, always a well. However, why would you make a staircase made of wood? So you could burn it. Yes, you 
you guys are on the ball. You had your Wheaties or whatever it is. They said, take it away, Bernard. So, what you would do, should an attacking army dare to cross that drawbridge, come under this wall, and you have the defenders up with those people are firing down on the attackers, should the attacking army threaten what's called the keep, the central portion, the defenders inside burn that staircase, they've got water, they've got food, they can hold out. And often in medieval warfare, attacking armies got close to the centre points of castles but never got through. Having said that, this place has never been attacked. <laughs> really? No. Until today. <laughs> um, this was where the king lived. Inside, pretty much an empty space, the king would bring what he's ca what's called his wardrobe, uh, which was the hangings, the furnishings, uh, not, you know, a closet. Yeah. Uh, it was actually the little sort of the law. Um, eventually, 200 years approximately after this is built, they moved to the king's middle. So they build, they build extensions out by the river, and eventually they move up to Westminster. And yesterday we saw Westminster, uh, the Palace of Westminster, uh, but What we're going to do, guys, is I want us to head straight up to see one of the most important uh, sites here at the Tower of London, the, the, the Crown Jewels. These are the jewels used in the coronation ceremony of kings and queens that we heard about at Westminster Abbey. So, what we're going to do is, I think, let's head straight up this way, the, the coronation regalia. So they are the jewels used in that ceremony at Westminster Abbey. And the first thing you'll see inside is a filmed presentation. You'll pass coats of arms first of the kings and queens, and you'll see how they've developed over the centuries. Then into a short film of the Queen being crowned nearly 60 years ago at the Abbey, Prince Charles as a little boy. Then it's through uh, uh, into uh, a corridor with a long line of maces, which are basically the ceremonial clubs used uh, to keep the public away when the monarch would uh, process <laughs> in uh, public gatherings. Then through a very thick set of safe doors to the jewels. Beautiful jewels, sort of state. Ancient spoon, 800 years old, place holy oil on the monarch's forehead. Wow. The tunic that he wore for the coronation, the super tunica, it's called gold, gold leaf. Then onto a moving walkway and the crown. So the crown of St. Edward, which is always used to denote the crowning of a king. Uh, after that, you'll see the scepter, a uh, star at the top of which sits one of the highest quality cut diamonds on planet Earth. Cullen and Diamond, 530 Whoa. Like a piece of like glass, a small fist size, it's the real Bitcoin, real thing. Found in South Africa, it came from a larger stone called the Star of Africa, subsequently cut into major stones. Uh, and then two other crowns to look for. The first crown, the old Queen Mother's crown, another very famous diamond on this crown, a round diamond, known as the Koi Noor diamond from India. Bad luck for a man to have that on any crown he wears. Always worn by a woman on a woman's crown. And the last crown to look for, the Imperial State Crown. That's the crown you might have seen the Queen wearing in official portraits, uh, perhaps at the state opening of Parliament. Also very famous diamonds on that. So Cullinan II, the second major stone cut from the Star of Africa. Black Prince's ruby, which looks like a bit of melted candy. It's actually not a ruby, it's a spinel. But very, very important historical provenance, meaning it's passed through uh, many kings and princes. Um, and a beautiful sapphire as well on the Imperial State Crown. So it's a one way system, and I'll be waiting for you at the exit. Um, there are some restrooms there, okay. um, and uh, it's, it's, it's fairly simple, it's a fairly simple procedure. If you're not sure about certain diamonds inside, there are attendants who will point stuff out for you. So I'll wait for you at the other end. Um, go and enjoy. Thank you.
uh, they build an extension out uh, by Traitor's Gate, actually above Traitor's Gate, and then they leave. They head up to Westminster. And then this place becomes famous or infamous as a prison. Um, but a prison only for high status prisoners and royals, not your common criminal. Uh, the common criminals are outside here. You go, your blood has got to be blue to get in here. Even if it's going to be spilt, it's got to be blue blood. Um, and then it becomes infamous as a site of executions, private executions inside the tower. And here at this site was what we call the site of the scaffold. All a scaffold is is a wooden structure set up for an execution. And on this site, seven people were executed. Seven. Seven that we know of. Um, of those seven, five were women. Five women. Uh, and of those five women, three queens of England were executed, lost their lives here. Let's go back to King Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII is infamous for having been married six times. Uh, eventually, with wife number one, Catherine of Aragon, he divorces and he marries Anne Boleyn. We heard that story briefly yesterday. They have a very intense relationship, love, hate, actually. Uh, one minute they're, they're absolutely besotted with each other, the next minute they, they, he, he wants to kill her. Um, uh, she's a feisty woman, a pale face, long black hair. Not particularly beautiful, uh, considered a beauty of her age. Nowadays would be considered more quirkily beautiful. Um, had six fingers, it was said, claimed by some people on one hand. Um, that didn't help her later on. Because what happens is, she gets pregnant, and she gives Henry a girl, Elizabeth. He already has a girl, Mary. At that time, Henry, it was all about boys. Henry wanted a boy. Uh, she quickly gets pregnant again, that's her job. Uh, she has a miscarriage. By now, it was said, that their arguments were getting tiresome to Henry, they were tiring him. She also, Anne, was, was, was a, a, an ambitious person, was bringing in some of her family into positions at court and she made a few enemies. Um, it was said eventually that Henry made the acquaintance of Jane Seymour and he wanted to get rid of her. Uh, she got pregnant one last time and had a stillborn male child. By now, she was desperate, she knew the cards were stacked up against her, and what happened was uh, charges were brought up, brought up against Anne of being many different things, of being a witch, of being a traitor, disagreeing with the king, but worst of all, she was accused of incest with her brother, George Berlin. None of this was true, all lies, but she had a lot of enemies, and she was brought to the Tower of London, brought to the Queen's house. Uh, the buildings over there, the half-timbered Elizabethan buildings, the Queen's House, and she was brought here for her trial. Um, the trial took place on that wall walk in what was called the Great Hall. It's not there any longer, the Great Hall. Um, but that's where the trial of Anne Boleyn took place. Um, she was implicated by her own sister-in-law. Her sister-in-law, a woman called Jane, Jane Boleyn, um, implicated Anne and her own husband, George Boleyn, as having had this affair, it was all lies. Um, Jane Boleyn was a nasty piece of work. Um, George Boleyn and his brother found guilty and executed, as were several others in this uh, uh, series of trials. Anne is found guilty. She defended herself, even her enemies, and she had plenty of enemies, sort of gave her uh, sort of credit for being tough. But she's sentenced to death. The only dispensation she's given is that Henry allows her the honour to be executed by sword as opposed to the axe. The scaffold site was erected. Um, Anne was brought out, uh, long black robes, her long black hair pulled high on her head. She mounts the scaffold. She professes her loyalty to the king. This is a private execution. The last minute, the swordsman was said to have felt sorry for Anne Boleyn. And he shouted, where is my sword? Where is my sword? And Anne turned, and as she turned, whoosh, off in one blow, the head of a traitor, dumped the remains in this church, the church of St. Peter at Vicula. If you stay here till after 1.30, they open up the church, and you can see uh, at the altar where she's buried. Um, the minute that Henry... <coughs> Um, he is, she's dead. He marries Jane Seymour of Windsor Castle. She gets pregnant. She has a boy, Edward. The future Edward VI, Henry is ecstatic. Um, however, his happiness turns to horror that evening as Jane Seymour develops a fever 
after giving birth and the next morning dies. He was absolutely devastated. Um, absolutely devastated. His favourite wife, he's buried with her at Windsor Castle. <laughs> Uh, eventually, he's persuaded it's a good idea to marry again, and he's shown a portrait. He's told about a princess from present-day Germany, a place called Cleves, Anne of Cleves, and she's rather dishy, as they say here. She's rather a looker. So he decides, yes, this is a good arrangement. She's sent for. She arrives by ship at Rochester on the coast. Henry was brought down. He boards the ship. It was said the moment that Henry got his first look at Anne of Cleves, he immediately had the portrait painter arrested. <laughs> Anne of Cleves looked nothing like her painting. Oh, no. He was deeply unattracted to Anne of Cleves. He described her as a mole of Flanders. It's not a term of endearment. Oh. Horse-like face. Oh. Um, but she was lucky, she gets a quick divorce. She was said to have even been given uh, Anne Boleyn's family home. Henry then decides enough with his foreign gals, I'm not gonna trust any portrait, I wanna set my eyes on something. And he set his eyes on a young girl, a teenager still, a bit of an airhead, a girl called <coughs> Catherine Howard. Catherine Howard, the youngest of a very high status family, the Howards, um, her elder brothers and elder sisters have had very uh, uh, sort of, um, focused education, but the young Catherine had been left to her own devices, bit of an airhead, no, no, no real intelligence. Um, but Henry was rather attracted, he's a bit of an older man now, she's a younger girl, and uh, he hears these stories that she's been around the block, shall we say. He chooses to ignore that, they get married, they have a good old time, they head around the country visiting the houses, um, and uh, she begins to also bring some of her family members into positions at court. Catherine Howard was Anne Boleyn's cousin. Not a good thing as it turns out for Catherine Howard. At Hampton Court Palace, Henry was given irrefutable evidence that Catherine Howard had been adulterous. She'd had a boyfriend and he was absolutely furious. She's immediately arrested, kept in her rooms as a, a, a prisoner. It was said she escaped her arrest momentarily, ran down the Great Hall, the Long Gallery at Hampton Court Palace, and pounded on the door of the Royal Chapel where the King was at prayer. And it was said that uh, she was dragged screaming back to her room. And if you go to Hampton Court Palace, if you listen at night, supposedly, you can hear the ghost of Catherine Howard screaming. Arrested with her, her chief lady in waiting. Why was she arrested? Because she knew about her mistress's infidelities and hadn't told anybody. What was that woman's name? I see the name down here, Jane Berlin. A stupid as well as an evil. <laughs> Brought both of them to the tower. They were both quite hysterical. Catherine Howard was tiny. Uh, they are sentenced to death very quickly. Catherine Howard was said in the, the, the nights before her execution, they're both sentenced to death. This time, no sword, it's going to be the axe. Um, she was hysterical, but obsessively placing her little neck on a block in her rooms in the Queen's house. The scaffold uh, was erected. The day came. She came up to the scaffold. It was said that she regained her composure and professed her loyalty to the King. And some people also claim that she owned up to having had a boyfriend. It didn't help her. Bam! dumped in this church, just like poor old Anne Boleyn, an uh, unmarked grave. Quickly brought up to the scaffold site, her head removed very quickly, Jane Boleyn gets her just desserts. The last of Henry's wives, Catherine Parr. Catherine Parr has the good luck to outlive Henry. She got into trouble as well, actually, but she, she got out of trouble. Uh, and she kind of nursed Henry in his old age. The six wives, the easy way to remember the wives, divorced, Beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, come on, let's head where this guy's playing around. His meal is normally steak uh, or kidneys. Maybe a bit of liver is a treat. They're not vegetarian, guys. You know, it's meat. The bloodier, the better. I mean, we are at the Tower of London, for goodness sake. Um, so apologies to vegetarians um, in the group.
Um, look, he's wandered off onto the green, tower green. Um, Got a little table. There are, you'll see them as we head around. In fact, you can see some over here. Look at the distance, guys. You see them in the cages? Yes, yes, so, we Those do. are juveniles. Um, they are the young ones, and um, they might have even misbehaved last night, so they've got time out in the cage. <laughs> There are six to eight ravens normally at the Tower of London. Six to eight. Now, these birds have been here time immemorial. We don't know when they first arrived, but they are linked to a tradition at the Tower of London which says, should the ravens leave the tower, the tower will fall. Oh. And if the tower falls, the king goes with the tower. Mm. So, when did this story become known? In the 1600s, Charles II, known as the Merry Monarch, partly because he had a lot of mistresses, um, <laughs> many mistresses, the Merry, Merry Monarch. Merry uh, uh, He was very merry. But he came to the Tower of London, and, he, and what happened was, I've told you the Tower of London is a palace, then it's a prison, execution site, it's a zoo, but amongst its uses, up in the White Tower was the first royal observatory. And that was where the king was looking at the stars. These birds were already here and they were messing with his telescope. The astronomer was furious. Uh, it's very important business, he's looking at the stars. So he goes, either the birds go or I go. <laughs> Who's still here? <laughs> the birds won out on this one and it was said Charles II was the king who heard this story. Charles II had a most unfortunate father. We heard about him yesterday. Poor old Charles I <laughs> lost his head. So with Charles II remembering what happens to daddy, <laughs> he's going to keep his birth with an insurance policy. <laughs> so they've been kept ever since. Now you'll notice these guys here, he has one wing slightly clipped. So he can't fly off, he can sort of flutter. Having said that, one of these guys fluttered over the walls a couple of years ago uh, and was found outside in St. Catherine's Dock loitering outside one of the pubs. <laughs> so this bird was quickly given, they all have names, given the nickname Grog. <laughs> grog was a term the Old English used for, it was a booze water mix because you had to mix the water with booze because the water would kill you in the old days. <laughs> the booze wouldn't kill you. <laughs> Um, one of the guards here... What happens is their uncle, this, uh, the late king's younger brother, also called Richard, um, looks after the boys and brings them to the Tower of London. Brings them to the garden tower. Now Richard, being played at the moment by Kevin Spacey at the Old Vic Theatre, uh, it's a brilliant performance, such a brilliant performance. Richard was, was famous, I should say infamous, because he's always described as a hunchback by William Shakespeare. He wasn't a hunchback, but he was, um, he had a back deformity. Anyway, he brings the boys to the Tower of London as regent to look after them, to prepare for Edward's coronation. It takes a long time to prepare for a coronation. So the boys are seen here in the summer of 1483, uh, and they're seen playing in the gardens in the grounds of the tower. However, as that summer wears on, in September of 1483, suddenly there's a proclamation by Richard claiming that these two young princes are illegitimate. They are not of the pure line of the throne. But he, his younger brother to the king, is not Shakespeare writes, my, my horse, my horse, my kingdom from a horse, as Richard was knocked down from his horse and was said to have been desperately trying to find another horse to mount at this battle. But he's killed in battle by Henry Tudor. And the Tudors come in. Richard, the last of the Plantagenets. So what about the young princes, 13-year-old Edward and 11-year-old Richard? Do you remember those names at the they Abbey? Disappear. What is said to have happened? They well, disappear. What does happen is after September, they're never seen again. Disappear. What's claimed to have happened is that while the boys are in the garden tower on the second level, sleeping in the royal bed, Richard gets some soldiers, some cohorts, to come in with pillows, smuggling the boys over their heads, suffocating them. And it said that was the last uh, the boys were ever heard of. Um, what I want to show you though is something, you can just move down uh, 
up the stairs. There's something I want to show you. For those of you who want to come down, those of you who want to wait up here, wait up here, I want to show you one thing. Quick. One from the King's Speech, the Queen's Uncle. Uh, the movie Madonna has just unveiled in, in Venice. W. E. Wallace and Edward, uh, the Queen's Uncle, who abdicates the throne to Mary Wallace is never known. And his younger brother, our present Queen's father. So when the Queen was born, she was of the royal family, but she was not in direct line for the throne. I want to say though, do you remember that wooden staircase we were talking about earlier today? You see that wooden staircase? A few hundred years ago, they were doing some work on the stones. And there's a niche, if you head into the White Tower later today, there's a niche halfway up and a plaque. What happened was, they removed some stones, and a stonemason was working on the stones when he suddenly noticed the bones of two humans. Oh! two young humans, and these were deemed to be the bones of the princes, uh, because there were no other children at that time being kept here. And these were then taken to Westminster Abbey and interred at that chapel where we saw the names Edward and Richard. We don't know for sure. What you can do is you can head up through this archway, up along and into the tower, and there's an <coughs> excuse me exhibition about the princes and the story, and you can see uh, the, sort of the main list of culprits because we don't know for sure that it was Richard. Henry Tudor is also a suspect for different reasons. You can actually vote on who you think is the most likely um, uh, suspect, um, and that entry is is just through the arch. It's it's far too small a space for me to take you all into. You can also see how Walter Raleigh was kept as a prisoner. So Walter Raleigh, the great adventurer. Uh, Virginia, tobacco, history of the world, um, was a prisoner here at the time. And he was very well accommodated because he was of high status. His family were here, he could sort of wander around. He ended up being executed. Uh, not here though, not at the tower. A minor detail, yeah. But he lived well while he was alive. Um, so uh, you, you, can, you can visit the, the, the Bloody Tower, it's fascinating. You can also, down to the left of the Bloody Tower, visit the Wakefield Tower if you want to hear about torture, major torture. So just to the left is the entrance to the Wakefield Tower, the Bloody Tower to the right. Um, you can also go into um, the tower above Traitor's Gate, St. Thomas's Tower. And you can go along a little bit of the wall walk and into the Royal Chapel where poor old King Henry VI was murdered. So lots to see and do there. <laughs> Somebody's also asked me about the Beecham Tower. It's spelled Beauchamp, pronounced Beecham. That's just to the left of the scaffold site, and you can see ancient graffiti left by prisoners. And you can see sculpted graffiti left by wealthy ancient prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> Who had other people do their, their autographs. So, guys, I'm going to hand over to Adam, who's going to let us know about our timings. Yes, so, so, so that blue lamp post at the top there, uh -huh. uh, at 12.30, if you'd like to come back with us on the coach to the hotel, uh, just meet us there at 12.30. Um, as it's an optional ride, you don't have to come with us. You have those tube passes to go and explore the rest of London as you wish. Um, the bus will be in the same area that we actually um, got dropped off, so for those of you who have um, cardigans, jackets, anything on the bus that you want to collect, we'll walk you to the bus as well. You can get those and come back and explore or head out this way as well. Okay. And also, just to let you know as well, um, to the left there is a um, um, uh, gift shop down on this side. There's a gift shop outside, there's a gift shop outside the jewels as well. So, And they have quite nice things, quite nice books as well and, and uh, leaflets, you know, little, little brochures, sort of, you know, quite, quite readable stuff if you're interested. Okay, and for those of you who want to come and see us later on as well, just to um, um, recap, in the lounge area of the hotel between 4.30 and 6 o'clock, come and see Landon and I, there's some scones and some high tea there for you to um, Two o'clock, well. <laughs> there's free booze. Two o'clock, there's free booze with booze me. And tea. Booze and tea. So sober up with us. Uh, right, with yeah. us. One yeah. thing too, anyone who's going to Foxtrot, yeah. our reservation is at 6.30. It's a 15 pound cab ride according to the concierge. Share cab is not the best way to approach it. I will go down about 20 of 6 and tell the concierge to have some cab available. Uh, the address, if you want to try to remember, your cab you should know. 79 Royal Hospital Drive Lane Park. I don't know. Royal Hospital Road. Yeah. Road. Yeah, Thank right. you. It's uh, past Buckingham Palace, yeah. about a three mile ride. Again.